Hi, I'm here with Josh Randall, uh, co-creator of Blackout. You just came back from Sundance. You're in the middle of 21, and you have off-season coming up. So I know you're a very, very busy man, so thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Speaking of the documentary, you just got back, and Blackout has always kind of been an urban legend. There's always been that mystery, like, is this real? What happens inside? There's been very little press. Why would you let someone inside that and make a movie? Uh, that's a really good question. We, uh, we being Chris and I, had very mixed emotions when we first agreed to the movie. I think uh, as a company, we were sort of saying yes to a lot of things at that point, trying to find where Blackout was headed. Uh, in what direction and collaborating with other people we were you know we worked with uh, Queens of the Stone Age and Skrillex and um, you know a couple of others in trying to sort of expand uh, the format that um, Blackout manifested itself in I guess and uh, we had always been wanting to work within the movie realm this opportunity came up uh, we met with the director a lot, had many conversations about the sort of parameters that they would put on it. And with those parameters in place, we felt comfortable uh, opening the door and, and, and working with them to hopefully create a compelling movie um, that gave them good material to work with, but not necessarily enough to um, spoil stuff. And what did you think of the finished product? Uh, again, you know, we had uh, a lot of mixed emotions. Um, I think Rich is a really good filmmaker. Uh, we both think it's a really well-made movie. Um, it executed really well. It looks fantastic. The um, the way Mike Pepin shot the movie is incredible. Um, and he's sort of done other awesome, great filming things for us behind the scenes as well. Um, so it sounds great. It looks great. Um, you know, the finished product is it's it's tough for us to watch. Uh, because there are definitely things that, you know, we don't always like to see on screen. And that kind of took a little bit of, um, you know, swallowing on our part to just sort of be okay with it. Um, that said, uh, we think it's a really well-made movie. And um, it is a good representation of what uh, a lot of the fans go through. And so, you know, a lot of people didn't believe it. And thought it was fake, uh, which is kind of hysterical and awesome. Uh, you know, it doesn't really help the movie. I wish people knew that uh, and really believed that it was real. But in terms of the sort of the, the legend of Blackout, as it were, um, it's a good movie. And it, it does well for the show. And it, it shows maybe a little too much, but... Um, by focusing on the fans and uh, their experience, uh, we think he made a really well-made movie. Really well done. Great. And if there was a, a blackout director's cut, would, would there be anything you would add or, or take away? No. I mean, listen, it's not our movie, so that's not <laughs> up to us. Uh, there might have been a couple things I would have taken away from the final cut that you guys uh, have seen or, or will see eventually. But um, no, you know, it's, it's not our movie. Uh, it's about blackout and it's about the people who go through it um but with that said uh you know we've never really approached that project with that in mind it is rich's movie and uh, we're happy to support that as best we can awesome uh, i haven't seen it but just reading every review i possibly can yeah. a lot of the reviews seem to mention mention that people the people that go through are in cults there's something wrong with us um you know things like that uh, that you, we're going through torture and, you know, I've been through multiple blackouts. I've never once thought, oh, my God, they're torturing me. Right. Is this do you think this is more of the common non haunt person seeing it and not understanding? Or do you think it's something more than that? Uh, you know, I think there's got to be a little bit of leeway to say it's a movie. Um, obviously, it's a documentary, but um, it is edited and there is sound that has been put on top of it. And I think. Um, you know, as with anything that gets sort of packaged and put together, you uh, lose, you know, a lot of the sort of truth sometimes of what's actually happening in the room. Um, and even though it is all completely true, it paints it in a very extreme picture, not to suggest that blackout is an extreme. I mean, obviously, there are many extreme things that you guys go through, um, but it 
doesn't talk about, um, nor do I think it should, but it is worth noting uh, within this interview that it doesn't talk about the safety measures that go into it. And, um, you know, it's it's an extreme show and sometimes, unfortunately, people get hurt and there's, you know, a little damage that happens uh, both physical and mental, but that's never our intention. Um, and we genuinely work very hard behind the scenes to make it as safe and doable as humanly possible so that people are able to go through it. You know, we're not, uh, this isn't fear, you know, fear factor. Um, you know, we're not trying to get people to tap out, you know, it's, we're, we're artists. And in that sense, I want people to finish the show. I want them to go all the way through it. So I'd like to find a way to push those boundaries for them as they go through it. Um, and for us to do that, there's a lot of safety that happens behind the scenes. You don't see that in the movie. Um, again, I don't think you necessarily should, uh, but you know, it is something that happens that I think sometimes people aren't necessarily aware of as they're watching the finished product. And sometimes they just say, you know, shit, those people are being tortured. Um, and I can't disagree with them watching the two minute cut of one of the segments, you know, you're like, God damn, that looks really <laughs> intense and bad. And I hope I don't get arrested for this. But, um, you know, with with that said, it it did happen. That is real. So, you know, kind of have to stand behind it at the same time. Now, Blackout's going into its seventh year. And I'm I'm pretty sure that you've had your fair share of negative reviews over the years. Mm, and one or two. <laughs> assuming you ha you've built up a thick skin for that. But when you see reviews for the Blackout experiments where they talk about your patrons in a negative way does do you have any issue with that like are the people that go through in a weird way kind of like your children that you look out for <laughs> um no <laughs> to be totally honest no they're not not to me um you know we value people's support immensely it's you know it is absolutely the only reason that blackout has continued is because of the support of the people who um you know, find uh, a, uh, both positive and negative experiences through the show, but find enough of a response, have enough of a sort of catharsis as they go through it that they're willing to come back for more. So, you know, I think Chris and I are so incredibly aware of that, so uh, so completely acknowledge that, have always tried to help foster that, and, and there's been a, a very clear line sometimes that, you know, unfortunately we've crossed and sometimes we haven't crossed where, you know, we're trying to help those people get together and find um, ways that they can share their experiences and make it more of a communal experience, even though the show itself is so individual. Um, you know, with that said... Um, people have really strange reactions to the show and I see people <laughs> potentially at their worst. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't feel protective of them, of, of the supporters in a sort of paternal sense. And I'm pretty sure I can answer for Chris that he doesn't either. Um, you know, but on the same token, uh, everyone, uh, I don't know, man. Everyone has an opinion, and uh, people can say what they want. They can call it a cult. I don't really care. Uh, it's We have developed a bit of a thick skin. Um, it is a very polarizing piece. Um, a lot of probably... There are probably more people in the world who are vocal on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter that hate it, and Yelp, yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, than, than the people that like it. It's just that the people that like it are so passionate about it. Uh, they will really go to bat for it. Um, and I think that's what we respect. That's what we support, acknowledge, and are completely aware of. Um, but we also, especially after seven years, are so blatantly aware that there's <laughs> nothing you can do about what people say about you. It is inevitable. And, you know, at this point, if a good positive review comes out, you just know the next two or three are going to be negative. Um, but that's kind of part of the game with Blackout. And uh, I think we've just sort of accepted it at this point. Now, we're in the middle of 21. Uh, chapter 2 is going on. Uh, chapter 1 happened uh, last month or in December. And first of all, everyone should be doing them in order. I just want to say that. <laughs> Go to Chapter 1. Thank you. Do that experience and then do Chapter 2. With, I don't want to spoil anything, so that's I'm only going to talk about those two. But 21 is very different from a blackout experience. 
Um, there's things that Blackout really hasn't done before, and I'm wondering how did 21 come about from the idea that first popped into someone's head to the actual execution of it? Um, yeah, I don't want to talk too much about 21, um, obviously, because it's happening, but uh, I will say this. You know, you said earlier it's a really different thing for Blackout, and in a weird way, I'd actually challenge that. Um, and I'd say uh, I think it's actually really similar it's just putting it within a completely new format and thereby allowing more people to do it, um, which is a big thing, obviously. There's a huge demand all over the world for people who want to experience it in some way. And when you do a you know three-week show with one person a night, you know, like you're just not going to get that many people through. So we want more people to experience it. But uh, sort of creatively, conceptually, I think it plays on what the people who it plays on the same fears um, and certain aspects that uh, people expect when they go through the live shows. It plays on paranoia, anticipation, um, fear of the unknown, allowing you to place your own uh, answers to questions. Um, and frankly, those are all hallmarks of the regular blackout live experience. And while, you know, obviously with 21, we're not, um, able to go, you know, tie up hundreds of people all over you know the country at the same exact time. Um, we can do it slowly and individually. So I'm just saying, you know, the option is there, but, um, it allows people to have a version of the blackout experience. And again, it's about creating paranoia, creating fear and allowing you uh, as the person going through it to play the game. And if you really want to go there um, and believe that blackouts hiding behind every corner, you know, trust me, we're there for you. And if you just sort of pay the 199 and kind of forget about it and every so often or like fuck who's calling me and why, why do they keep hanging up and like why what the fuck and then you sort of forget about it you can do that too and frankly that's almost exactly our experience with the live show as well which is some people come in and play the game and other people's you know other people sit there uh questioning it and fighting and talking back and you're like all right well it's not really going to work for you anyway so in terms of the creation of it uh, I won't go too much into it except to say that it kind of, I might just be repeating myself here, but, uh, you know, I think we are trying to continually expand the show creatively, conceptually, in what Blackout is and how it can reach, you know, uh, the widest audience possible. Kind of try to stay ahead of the curve from other people that are, you know, just starting to blatantly copy it. And, um, and allow people to create the blackout experience for themselves at home at two o'clock in the morning or two ten in the morning or you know whatever the <laughs> time that those emails hit are uh, that you're sitting there at home and it's it's about being paranoid it's about not knowing if someone's outside the door and if you're the kind of person that believes we're there knocking uh, you know as I'm sure you know there's enough in twenty one to um, both chapters one and two uh, to say you know we're there um, for you if you want us to be. And that's a really good point because, you know, my the reason I asked that question is because of the format, you know, but it makes perfect sense exactly what you said. So you win this challenge, Mr. Randall. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but exactly everything you said, you know, I was that person freaking out at two in the morning, like, you know, peeking out curtains and stuff. So it, you got me. <laughs> Cheers. That's good to hear, though. You know, I think uh, I'll say this. 21 is definitely, um, you know, as with everything Blackout does, you know, people love it and then a lot of people hate it. Uh, and um, it's it's definitely a new something, a new format, a new medium that we're trying or many mediums, I should say. Uh, and it's been fascinating to watch it. Um, and it does actually remind me a little bit of when the live show started six years ago. And, you know, some people are confused, some people are into it, some people hate it, some people pass it along, some people just quietly do it and freak themselves out. So it all works. Cool. In 2009, uh, you and Chris started, and it was a Midsummer's Nightmare. When that started, and, you know, the, you're putting the show together, and you had your first night, 
what did you think would would happen? And that's just a general question. And what and what I mean is like, do you think you would be where you are now? No, <laughs> uh, I I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. I mean, I'll uh, I'm not obviously laughing that much out loud, but I've got a big smile on my face when you ask that because no, we had no fucking idea. Um, I don't know what we expected. Um, we didn't expect this. I, I'm not really sure we expected anything more genuinely than just a, a three week run, you know, same thing we did with all the other shows back at that theater. Uh, I think at that point in 2009, I had been managing that space for, as the, the theater manager there for about five or six years and geez, I don't know, in five years, we probably produced maybe like 20 shows or something. And of those 20 shows, you know, Chris directed probably three or four of them. And, and we got very uh, friendly and tight with each other just in terms of, you know, a, a sort of work collaboration. We became really good friends. Um, this was just a kind of fun idea to throw into the mix of everything else we were doing. But then it struck a chord, obviously. Um, and so we decided to, to continue to pursue it. But I can pretty safely say at the time there was never an intention of even doing a second show. I mean, it was just, we were just doing a haunted house. We kind of thought it'd be funny, throw people in alone. And we made all these crazy rules that like went against the traditional haunted house. And we we're like, this would be a weird experiment. Um, and then it just worked. And, you know, sort of ever since then, that's now just sort of what we work on horror stuff. But, uh, you know, neither Chris and I are, are particularly like huge horror geeks or um, uh, we've always been big, you know, horror movie fans and, and love haunted houses and all that. But um, I, I don't think we're your typical haunted house guys. I've read many interviews uh, that you've given where you, you obviously have a theater background, both of you and Chris, and you have done, you know, plays by Shakespeare, Chekhov. Those are names you always mention. And with the success of blackout even though you have a background in theater is your i'm not sure the right word to say it, but is your is it changing for you like do you you know back in the day before blackout you, like oh i want to do romeo and juliet in this weird way but nowadays is it oh i want to do this weird thing in blackout instead of going to something you might have gone to yeah um you know that's a that's a, a that's a really good question um I think, uh, I mean, I'll answer it for myself. Uh, if Chris were here, which unfortunately he's not, I, I know um, he would answer it very differently. Um, so, you know, Chris continues to work on a lot of theater projects. Uh, he directed a movie last year. Um, so uh, I think he, he does very much continue in that realm. <laughs> uh, and this is a great source of sort of conflict between us, but I do not. Um, and I'm done with the, the whole Shakespeare checkoff <laughs> thing. And I have been for a really long time. Um, you know, it's funny for me. And again, I'm, I'm really just answering this on, on behalf of myself, but, uh, blackout, uh, is an extension of what we went through and frankly was born out of the failure of a lot of our previous shows. And so I think, and again, I'm just, you know, hindsight is 2020, but um, there was a lot of anger, at least there was for me. And again, I, I'm going to say this one more time. Chris is going to be listening to this. And I <laughs> promise I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, but um, there was a lot of anger uh, in terms of not achieving a certain amount of success with shows that we thought surpassed a lot of other things that were getting funded um, and that more ticket buyers were going to. And, you know, the indie theater world in New York City is a, a hard, hard game. Um, and uh, I played it in many different ways and worked for bigger theaters and worked for smaller theaters and produced and was on administration stuff. And so I think for me, um, uh, some of blackout boils down to a little bit of anger at the theater world and kind of going, well, fuck you. Uh, and if we're going to, I have a theater and I'm going to do this show and I don't care how you actually, I do care how you see it. And I care so much. I'm going to throw you down on your knees, put a bag over your head and make sure that you can only see it from this little opening that I show you and I'm going to make sure that you can't breathe very well and I don't care if you like it and if you don't want to see the theater in this way then get the fuck out 
And I think that to me, that's the sort of, I see that as being the seeds of blackout um, in that sense of I'll allow you to come in and watch this, but it's on my terms only. I've tried to play by your game for a really long time. Didn't really seem to work. So now if you're coming into my theater, it's my game. It's my, and it's something we say to the actors a lot. This is my house. You know, this is this, they don't get to say shit. This is our house. And you know, what we say goes, and if it doesn't, they're out. So I see that as, as, as correlating pretty strongly. Now you started in New York and then based on the success there, you came to LA do you see a difference in what affects the New Yorkers versus what affects Los Angeles or you did a show, a show in Chicago, what affects them? Are there certain scenes where one city responds to more than the other? Uh, I don't mean to be a dick, but no. Okay. No, not at all. I mean, I think it's, it's really an individual kind of show and some nights, you know, you can look at it almost on a night by night basis and say, you know, wow, everyone responded really strongly to this, this room tonight. Whereas this one, which usually gets everyone like safety or whatever, is nobody safety out tonight. Huh. What's that about? Never really tried to delve too deeply into that. It just kind of <laughs> is what it is. I mentioned before the blackout is kind of an urban legend. There's a lot of mystery behind it. How do you feel when people post spoilers and walkthroughs of your shows? Um, I think it sucks. Uh, we're not really happy about it. Um... But uh, it's also dictated a little bit of, you know, a concept, which is now we can't repeat. You know, we always have to keep doing new stuff because of that. Um, it's not a terrible thing artistically to always have to keep reinventing. Um, so I don't entirely mind that. And I also can acknowledge um, that with those spoiler reviews, it becomes what it's become. Uh, so, uh, it sucks to see it get out there, but on the same token, I can acknowledge now seven years in that if it weren't for a lot of those reviews, we wouldn't have the reputation that we would have. Um, so, uh, it's kind of bittersweet. I acknowledge it, but I guess I would ultimately prefer it not to be there. It, it's, I feel like it's, it's not to, obviously not to answer for you, but I feel like it's like a double-edged sword, you know, especially from a patron's point of view, because... Uh, like if a spoiler's out, you try as hard as you can not to read it. Yeah. But be before Blackout came to LA, that's how I found out about you. Yeah. You know, so Absolutely. it's like, oh my god, this this Blackout show sounds amazing, and then I find out it's coming to LA. I would buying tickets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it. The, you're right. It's a double edged sword. Um, you kind of got to accept it. It's the same thing with the bad reviews. You know, for um, you just have to accept that it's it's going to come. But you know, on the same token. I think you uh, probably of all people know too because you have been a, f uh, a fan for so long and have gone through enough shows and probably read a ton of reviews and, and bad reviews and good reviews that a lot of it's not true mm -hmm. um, and that people just make shit up uh, or they think something happened to them that didn't really happen to them. And again, that in Blackout is great. You know, I'm happy to have that rumor sort of like circulate if you know we didn't have the money to like make it happen but if it happened in their mind great i'll take the credit for it but um a lot of it isn't true uh and that's always weird because you're sort of like wow you're spreading lies and you're helping to perpetuate this but it's not true so and i you know on behalf of blackout none of us can like go online and sort of be like hey this is josh and <laughs> that's not true so you know we're always kind of put in a weird place it, I have actually an, a story about that. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was hanging out with someone, and she she it was like, "Oh, what are you doing this weekend?" I was like, "Oh, I'm going to blackout. I can't wait." It's like, "What?" And started yelling and swearing at me, and I was like, "Well, what's your problem?" She's like, "They support raping women. They support abusing oh, women, stuff like yeah, that." Yeah. And it was a typical kind of keyboard warrior type of thing, yeah. where I was like, "Well." you know, what happened to you? And it's like, oh, nothing. I read it online. I was like, wait, so you've never been through blackout yet. You're saying you're going to protest them because they do this and they do that, but you've never seen it firsthand. And she's like, well, yeah. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There you go. Uh, and it's funny on behalf of blackout, you just sort of have to sit there and go, okay, uh, great. Well, don't know what to say anymore. I'm just going to leave. Um, and uh, that's, that's definitely a tough thing. There was somebody who asked a question at Sundance that I thought was kind of awesome. Um, 
I wish I had responded better uh, at the mo in the moment, but uh, in retrospect, I've been thinking about it a lot. And he asked, he went through uh, one of the Halloween shows in 2013, which was called uh, Blackout Elements, as you may remember. And uh, he basically was like, I was such a big fan of the first half of the show, loved it, was so into it. And then the second half of the show, I just thought was like really over the top and melodramatic. And it's like all of a sudden it just sort of became about like violence towards women. And it was sort of like kind of like a, a dumb commentary about, you know, the final women in horror movies. And, and why would you... And I think the question he was trying to ask, um, besides for just like signaling to the crowd that he wasn't a fan of the show, uh, was something along the lines of like, why would you make the show about something so trite and like overdone and, and whatever? Um, and it's funny because I've thought so much about that. And as I'm sure you know, you know, he did, he did like the first half, but didn't like the second half. I'm sure we can find people that didn't like the first half, but like the second half. Some people who liked all of it, some people that like none of it. Um, but he hit the nail on the head. He was like, all of a sudden, I got what you were going for in that moment. There was a theme. Whether or not that was actually what we were going for is irrelevant. The fact is, he was like, all of a sudden, it became about women and violence. And what a dumb concept. Uh, and like, I didn't respond to that at all. And like, why would you do something like that? And it was such a perfect reaction to Blackout, I thought, because here he was actually highlighting exactly what that moment was about. Violence against fucking women. There is, you know, a horror movie, uh, uh, just cliche with the, the sort of final woman. And um, you could look at those last 15 minutes as a massive um, uh, uh, critique or comment or whatever it is you want it to be on horror and how they utilize women and the violence against them and how sometimes you're the victim, sometimes you're the aggressor, sometimes, you know, all of it. And in truth, I love that that's sort of what he took away from it. Now, to other people, they responded so strongly to that. And they were had a really hard time with the, the women scenes and, and um, it really affected them when the violence had to happen at the end and then they became the aggressor as opposed to the victim and they sort of saw it as this massive thing. Now for him, it had no effect on him whatsoever. Um, to which I kind of want to reply like, well, what is that about you? Are you gay? Are you straight? Do you have a girlfriend? Do you treat her well? Do you treat her poorly? Have you raped someone? Have you not? Are you a feminist? Are you, you know, all of those things allow him to go, oh, they're just making a comment about women but I don't care about that and to me that's more of a comment on him and what he brings into the show than the actual you know than what it is we're trying to comment on and that was a really long roundabout story uh, and I don't even remember what the beginning was um, except to say that it's just it's always a, a polarizing piece and we're, we're dealing with just people who love it and hate it and trying to sort of navigate that world after creating what you've created over the, the past seven years, when you go through other haunts, because you mentioned you do like haunted houses, horror movies, and things like that, does anything scare you anymore? I don't think anything scared me before. Um, you know, Chris and I <laughs> are both just really, uh, I don't know if jaded is the right word, because we're not jaded. We're just, uh, just very hard to have an effect on, I guess. Um, and uh, I go through a lot of haunts. I go through a lot of immersive shows and sleep no more and, you know, all those good things. And um, even before Blackout, uh, I don't know if I was the best audience member. It's very hard to have an effect on me. Uh, you know, listen, that said, I probably would never buy a ticket to Blackout and go through it. It's just it's not something I would personally want to push myself through unless I was on the other side of it, as fortunately I am. I was actually going to ask that question. Like, if you didn't create it, would you go through? No, <laughs> I wouldn't. I just, you know, for me, uh, I think um, it's, uh, it's a very specific thing. And um, it's awesome to, to, to be behind the scenes of it. Um, but I also recognize some of the difficulty that it brings for certain people. And I'm just not sure that I would be the best person to go through that. And with that being said, do you t ever test the scenes on yourself, even though you wouldn't go through? Yeah, yes, yes, we do. 
Uh, I mean, I won't say too much about that, um, but we do test them. Uh, a lot of times it's really about watching other people mainly go through it and seeing what people respond to. So a lot of times we have to watch it more than actually experience it. Uh, but yeah, we, we go through. And out of all the scenes that Blackout has created, do you have a favorite? Is there one that just sticks out of your minds? Like, I can't believe that came from my brain or from Chris's <laughs> brain. This is amazing. Um, I'll say this. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of Blackout. Like when, when I look at the last seven years and the amount of shows that we've done, and there are so many moments and so many scenes that run through my head that, you know, some that I hate and I think failed miserably. Uh, and then some that I'm madly in love with that I was like, that was just fucking gorgeous and effective and beautiful and scary. And, um, and I know that because, I was holding the thousands of people as they went through it and feeling everyone's heart. You know, it's like a palpable response. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, frankly, there, there is, there are a couple of sequences that are favorites of mine. Um, I think there's one show in particular that I would probably pick as, as being the most successful, uh, probably the best manifestation of what we've been trying to achieve. Um, but I'm, I mean, I'm just, I'm not going to say that, <laughs> I'm of course. Tell you what those are, of course. but yeah, sure. I've got a favorite. Earlier, you mentioned that you and Chris like to facilitate, you know, survivors getting together and, you know, talking about their experiences to one another. How does it feel to something that you and Chris created to have that many people come together that probably would never have come together before in their lives. It's hard to explain. It's, um, it's extremely overwhelming. Uh, it's a really powerful feeling. Um, you know, we've always worked in theater, which is basically about a shared experience, a communal experience with the people in that audience and on the stage in that moment, that night. And so I think to see that translate through a different format, that people would be like, how, if you put people through individually and you torture the shit out of them and they come out, you know, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> mentally cracked or like whatever, how do you see that as a, a communal experience? But somehow, uh, Blackout has been able to transcend that. And for something that was designed to be a completely unique and indiv individual experience for ba basically anyone going through, has actually become something uh, uh, that's extremely powerful as a communal experience and as a shared experience. And, you know, that's always been a big part of our theatrical history together. We used to, you know, I think the first show, well, maybe not the, first, the second show, the first one we did was really weird, but the, the second show we did was actually like a, a, a weird version of dinner theater. Um, and that was a really big part that like after the show, they would sort of sit there and eat and, and converse and talk about what they just saw. Um, so to see that happen with blackout is really overwhelming and, uh, really a, a very powerful thing to, to witness. And I don't know, it's, you know, we're not facilitating it. The funny thing is, is like we help it, but it, ju it does just happen kind of on its own. And that's more powerful to just sort of give like a little push here and there. And then to watch all these people sort of run, run with it. Uh, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing. It's super cool. And just to, just to build on that, I've met some of my closest friends just through blackout, you know? Yeah, so I mean, awesome. thank you for that. And you're welcome. And it, it's true what you say. It, it, it's amazing, you know? And when I first went through, I realized really quick that I could not talk to anybody about what happened. Mm. You know, I mean, people look at me weird enough. It's like, oh, yeah, I went through this hunt and it was there was like blood and guts. And even that they're like, mm, OK, weirdo. But <laughs> right. trying to explain blackout to someone that really yeah. doesn't isn't into horror, like you learn really quick what you can and can't say. And that's why finding other survivors, it, it, it meant so much to me because I could be like, oh my God. And then when this happened and when that happened, it's like, you get it. You understand. I'm right. like not a weirdo. And well, the funny thing is, is that I think the content is so extreme that it takes somebody who's been through it and has had a positive experience with it 
to be able to sort of put it in perspective. Um, and then, you know, you find yourself in a blackout way having these conversations with like, so then that guy with the staple gun ran up and staple gun me and then threw me back into the naked woman who made me shoot her in the face. And, you know, to any person who's going, th- you know, who hasn't experienced that, they're sort of like you sick fucking pervert and <laughs> yep. like, what's wrong with you. <laughs> But going through it, I think you're able to sort of transcend that a little bit and be like, okay, it's not, you know, I didn't really shoot someone in the face. I didn't really get staple gunned, but they made me believe that for a a really quick second. And it made me have have these feelings and these emotions or this, you know, uh, journey or, or whatever it is. And unless you've had that journey, unless you respond positively to it, it's hard for people to get past the content. Um, they cannot accept that. I think people can accept this level of sort of extreme horror and still get something from it. What I was just kind of saying is how, like, I couldn't talk to anybody about it based on what I went through. Did you and Chris ever have that experience with each other where it's like, I have this idea. Everyone's going to look at me weird. I can't talk to anybody about this. Um, uh, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, a little <laughs> bit. Yeah, without a doubt. You mean to each other or to other people? Right. Yeah, like when you first thought of, or whoever first thought of Blackout, and they're like, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this, What was there a bit of, like, gun shyness to bring to it up to each the other? other person? Yeah. No, no, okay. not to each other. No, Chris and I are very, very close and very good friends at this point, and um, I think for a very long time we've always been able to um, – you know, we have a really uh, rich sense of humor, I'll call it. And um, there's not much that's off limits for us. Like, we're not particularly offended by much because we, I mean, it sounds so stupid, but we have really good communication skills. So we can always be like, okay, here's this crazy, fucked up, perverted thing that you may judge me for. (laughs) But let me explain to you why and what the purpose is and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we can do that with each other. Um, There have definitely been times, though, um, you know, uh, where whether it be with, you know, my 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 ex, my former partner or Chris's now wife that like we've sort of sat between us and been like, we don't know if we could actually execute this just because um, we can't take it back to his wife or we can't take it back to, to my partner. There's sort of a, um, a, there was, there was a little bit uh, of a joke, but it was absolutely a thousand percent true um, that my uh, former partner used to get bail money for both Chris and I before every blackout show. Um, No joke Uh, because um, he was so utterly convinced that what we were doing was so fucked up and illegal that we would be arrested. And the funny thing was, is that if we brought something back to him or to, to Chris's now wife that, um, you know, they were sort of like, Oh, that sounds scary. Oh yeah, that's good. Or, you know, whatever we'd be like, Oh, that sucks. You know, it's not a good (laughs) idea. We can't do it. But it's when they, you know, when both of them are sort of like, what do I have to go get bail money? And like, have you guys thought of it? Have you talked to your lawyers about that? And blah, blah, blah. Then we're like, okay, good idea. We hit on something. It's good. (laughs) So Chris and I don't have much of a filter, but you know, that's allowed us, I think, to come up with some, some pretty hardcore shit. Um, but we're definitely conscious of, you know, what families happen to be sitting around us any, any time we're together, um, because it's very hard for us to have any conversations without being like, all right, lean in and like get really, really quiet. Be like, so I had this idea and then it kind of goes from there. Speaking of ideas on the 2015 Scarlet Extreme Hot Panel. You had you had mentioned that for the first time in six years, there was a point where you thought it was too much. One yeah. of the scenes. Yeah. Once once you came to that realization, what happens next? And then how do you, as creators, make sure that that point doesn't happen again? Well, I mean, how how we make sure is we just don't do it again. I mean, <laughs> there's that. So that's that's a pretty easy one. Um, uh. I'm trying to think of how I want to answer that. Um, just because uh, it went too far for us um, doesn't mean, in the grand scheme of things, uh, that it was too far for Blackout. 
Um, I think it just sort of meant that we had reached a level where we had maybe run out of ideas that that weren't well I, I I'll say this that we had potentially run of run out of ideas that you know weren't safe for us anymore um, and maybe we just had to get into territory that we were like this is this is pushing them but it's also pushing us um, and I think um, yeah I, I, I don't know what to say I, I just uh, we had some very strong responses to it we dealt with that personally individually um, but uh, you know it's blackout you can't expect to do something like that without being affected by it right. you know interestingly enough we were also a couple scenes were censored when we were in San Francisco for the Inferno show um, so it it does seem like and I'm just kind of this is all running through my head right now and I'm just kind of talking out of my ass but it is interesting that within the last nine months you know, uh, we hit a level where we were like, whoa, 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 <laughs> slow down. Um, and uh, so did other people, frankly. Um, so, you know, take that as you will. But it's, it is kind of worth uh, noting. Now that Extreme Haunting and Blackout have gotten bigger and even more accepted, are you willing to push that envelope more and try things you might have not tried within the first few years of Blackout? No. No, you know, I think, uh, listen, we have a very clear idea of what we're trying to do, what we want to do. Um, I think Chris and I are both incredibly uh, creatively strong in that sense. Uh, we don't, first of all, we've never considered ourselves to really be part of the haunt community. They've always shunned us. And um, even though I think, you know, there are not many articles about haunted house, national haunted houses at this point that don't mention blackout in some way. That said, none of those guys accept us. Um, they don't talk to us. And, you know, we've been threatened to be sued before by other haunts. And, um, you know, as you know, there are just uh, the, the sort of the, the copies that are coming out now. Um, so it's undeniable that we're a strong part of the, the haunted house industry. But we've never really considered ourselves to be part of that. Um, and with that in mind, I kind of go back to your, to your question, which was like, no, we have no desire to be like, Oh fuck. Well, you know, horror nights is doing this this year. So let's, let's do that instead. Um, frankly, that's what's led all the people who are now copying blackout to make their copies. And honestly, it's just, you know, artistically creatively, it's not something we have a desire to do. Um, I don't want to go to someone else's haunted house and, and be like, what a good idea. I'm going to steal that for blackout. Fuck that. You know, mm -hmm. I'll come up with my own fucking idea. And yeah. So in, in that sense, no, I just, I, I don't think we've ever really been in competition with those guys. There's clearly room for everybody. Um, and blackout is pretty strong in what it wants to do and the direction that it's headed and i think as long as we stay true to that we're uh we're you know we're doing our thing that's all we can really say what would you say the biggest issue or obstacles are with blackout and creating a show you know I, listen on I, there are a million ways i can answer that question do you mean from an audience's perspective from a director's perspective from a producer's perspective um uh, each of them carry their own problem, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I think over seven years, we've sort of identified how to counter uh, a, a lot of those things and, or, or how to directly address a lot of those issues. But, you know, safety is a, is a big one, obviously. <laughs> uh, <laughs> frankly, creative content is a really big one. Um, selling tickets is a really big one. Web presence is a really big one. You know, as you know, there's always, you know, it's very rare that blackouts just sort of like, oh yeah, we're just doing the show next week. And yeah. <laughs> um, it's a big ordeal and shows have their own images and campaigns. And, you know, even though a lot of some of those campaigns are like silence and black pictures and and you know not strong uh well i i don't want to say not strong but they they each have very strong choices 
Um, and all of those, you know, from a marketing perspective, audience perspective, directing perspective, creative perspective, they carry big issues. Um, and it's a pretty tight group that creates the show, uh, producer, directors. Um, so, uh, as, as a team, you know, we've basically, it's, you know, it's, we face any issue that any production that's starting to be mounted faces, insurance, safety, tickets, money you had mentioned that blackout lives anywhere and everywhere we can put it and you mentioned cargo vans hotel rooms uh space places with different square footages yeah is there any place you wouldn't do a show and is there a dream spot you would love to do a show uh yes and well okay so no and yes um uh, you know, I, I agree with, I guess myself, uh, <laughs> blackout lives everywhere. You know, I think that there's something to be said, especially with 21, um, where there is this acknowledgement. The hope is that there's a, this acknowledgement that it's about paranoia. It's about fear. It's about, you know, you freaking yourself out and walking up the dark stairs in your home at night and sort of being like, did I just hear something outside? Could that be? 21 could that be one of those volunteers that's knocking on my door um so with that you know anyone that's been through it this isn't a spoiler but anyone that's been through it probably knows the phrase it's never over dot 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 uh and you know i sort of say that with a smile on my face but it's true Blackout has been in cargo vans. We have been in hotel rooms. We've gone to people's houses. We've done it in warehouses. We've done it in theaters. We've done it in art galleries. We've done it in movie theaters. We've done it in basements. We've done it in... I mean, fucking name it. Um, is there a dream space? I don't know if there's a dream space. I mean, we definitely have some pretty big plans um, and people that we're working with and locations that we're working with that, you know, people may not officially hear anything for from for for a very long time uh but um so with that no i, I mean unfortunately i'm not going to tell you but yeah we got a ton of dream ideas um except to say that it really can happen everywhere and i think that that's part of the appeal of the scariest part of blackout is you know when you buy that ticket when you hit submit on the website they're really for 21 there really is this unknown and other people have tried to tap into that and make their shows about that. And you get, you know, emailed the location the night before. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, we started that six years ago, seven years ago as a consistent thematic uh, element. And with that, I think Blackout does live everywhere. You know, who fucking knows where we're coming next? Although I do. Tease. Um so um, based on locations, uh, this past year, you partnered with kink.com and did Blackout Inferno. And that was at the Armory in San Francisco, which by, you know, at least the shows I've been to with Blackout was a huge space. Yeah. Um, was that a challenge due to the space? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, I'll say Inferno was a great experience. Um, we had a really good time. Uh, we liked working in that building and uh, obviously probably goes without saying there's a lot of fun things that you know you get to witness just by being there um but you know with that notwithstanding um every space we're in provides a million different issues uh this goes back to our question earlier but like from a production point of view you know, certain warehouses may be so big that the amount of plastic we need to create it is, you know, really overwhelming. Uh, conversely, the space can be really small, but, you know, maybe we're not allowed to drill into the walls or something, which adds a whole nother layer. Um, you know, with uh, working at the Armory, uh, it's obviously a building that was built in the early 1800s. So there was a lot that we were not allowed to do just because the building itself is a landmark and you know, so, and it's a working production studio. So, you know, Monday to Friday, uh, nine to six, they had a full production schedule, shooting schedule, uh, in our space every single friggin' day. Um, so that in and of itself provided a lot of issues, but, um, that for us is actually, that's what makes the show. 
because then those questions start getting those those directorial conceptual questions start getting answered in that okay well if we can't put a permanent installation in this room we can only do this 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 or this let's choose this um, if we can't use their lights because they're going to be changing every day let's do this instead um, you know and how that plays out is different for every show um, and while it did provide its problems, I mean, I honestly, I wouldn't say it was any more difficult than any of the other spaces we've been in, without a doubt. So they had a, a lot of sets, like actual, like sets all set up and, you know, different scenarios and whatnot. When you were writing the show, did you have those sets in mind or did you have to force certain things in a way for, for certain rooms? Or? No, we were, we, we are, um, we were very clear about what sets we wanted to use and kind of how we were going to work them in so uh yeah i mean we knew we knew what we were walking into with that blackout has seemed to have a connection with dante's inferno there is this show called inferno and basing it on dante's inferno there's been other times where blackout has used the phrase abandon all hope all ye who enter here was the Inferno show a conclusion to, to that, or is it in the middle, or is this something we're just thinking too much about? Uh, I, you know, listen, I can't answer that. Um, uh, I'm glad that people are making a connection to certain source materials. Um, there are several other source materials that w we may or may not be missing here. <laughs> that if you look at the last six years, I mean, there are very specific references. Um, and in, uh, well, there are very specific references that we make to, um, I'll say a select number of uh, things that, uh, you know, artistically we have a connection with. Um, it's awesome that uh, somebody is picking up and highlighting uh, Dante's Inferno. Clearly that's, that's one of them. Um, there are others. Um, and how all of that gets played out is obviously a mystery. I'm not going to say it, uh, but is also up to you. Um, in that, uh, how, you know, frankly, I'm sure there are more references to Inferno than, than you guys are probably even picking up on. Um, and you know, with that, uh, we've had many different, uh, uh, source materials that we are very specifically referencing and trying to make a comment on or try to just reference, I should say. And, uh, yeah, so, so Inferno is not alone in that. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to say for that. Okay. Thanks. Welcome. <laughs> also with the Scarole panel, you had mentioned that Chris said that he, that you guys look for kindness in actors. That's one of the main things. And when, when I first met you and you were talking to the survivors, you said that you knew within five minutes from talking to someone that you needed to know everything that you need to know and acting came secondary. Um, in the last three years since you made those comics, have you found that to still be true? Uh, yeah. So, uh, wait, if I may, uh, just sort of rephrase the question. I, I, is what you're asking that, um, I said at a certain point that I could talk to somebody for five minutes and I'd know whether or not they'd be able to be an actor for yeah. blackout or be an audience member. Yeah, you said, like, if they were uh, auditioning, yeah. you okay. knew everything okay, you right. would need to know. Oh, fuck. I'd say, it, like, within 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah, 30, 45, 30 to 45 seconds, without a doubt. Um, our audition process is very fast sometimes. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, it takes a very specific person, I think, to execute Blackout well from the inside. Um, there's, it's not really a criteria that we have, but, uh, like, you know, I said this earlier, Chris and I are, are creatively, I think pretty strong in what it is we want and what we're going for. Um, and we have enough experience within this business, not just through blackout, but through just being directors and actors and producers and living in New York and being surrounded by actors and directors and producers. You just know there are certain people that can do it and certain people that can't. And one of the more... Uh, common things is somebody actually being really aggressively um, forward with how much they want to be an actor in it 
and you just know for a fact um, that I'm like, you wouldn't last 10 minutes. I know I could send two people through your room and, you know, male or female, you're going to come out crying and you're going to be done for the night without a doubt. So um, it's just something we've sort of, I think, honed in on over the last several years. And you spoke about this a little bit, and I think I know the answer, which is going to be no comment in a weird, in a way. Um, Probably. But what else is in the future besides blackout? You know, you mentioned that you you may or may not be working with other people and creating material and events. And you know, Chris directed a film, and he's still going in the theater world. You know, what what is there that's non blackout that you would love to be doing? I mean. You know, Chris and I both have, um, our, you know, really high artistic interests. Um, you know, Chris is working on, uh, I think, um, well, not I think, um, he's, he's directing some shows, he's teaching, uh, he's, he directed two movies, two independent movies within the last couple of years. Um, you know, I think my interest probably lies a little bit more in the sort of music event world. Um, there are a couple of other projects that I have non blackout related, uh, sort of within the event production medium. Um, but you know, we both keep coming back to this pesky blackout show, <laughs> uh, because it really just, it keeps demanding, um, a lot of attention and, uh, that's, that's not a bad thing. We're, we're thankful to, to have, to have it to work on. And this is going to be my last question. So uh -oh. what would 2016 Josh tell 2009 Josh, knowing what you know now? <sighs> <laughs> Oh man, regarding blackout or life, because I've got so <laughs> much to say about fucking life. Um, <sighs> that's a good question. It is indeed, uh, with air quotes there, uh, it is a good question. Um, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to have a hard time answering it. I don't know. Um, we did... God, I've honestly, I've never been asked that question before. I don't know. Um, we did all we could during the times that we had to make the show be that it, the, make it be the best that it can be. And I think that we tripped up along the way a couple times, uh, maybe more than a couple times. Um, again, there, you know, we might have pushed the line a little too far. Maybe sometimes we didn't push it far enough. Uh, but I look back and it make it all makes sense to me. Um, the trajectory of how it happened, you know, you mentioned in 2009, the first show was called two, you know, it was called Midsummer Nightmare. I mean, it's like the silliest thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, it kind of makes me cringe when I say it. Um, but I also wouldn't change that um, because it makes sense. I, rem you know, I don't know what I tell myself. You know, people need the extremity, like tie them up faster. <laughs> you know, it took us a couple years before people started getting tied. And then, you know, at first it was cloth bags. And again, I remember every step of that way. Chris and I joke uh, all the time about that first moment that we actually tied somebody. Um, and that we were both standing there sort of being like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, I can't believe we're doing this. Um, I remember the first time a plastic bag went over someone's head. I remember the first time we asked somebody, Jesus, first time we, first time was uh, take off your shoe and your sock. You know, it sounds like a joke right now, but it was so fucking effective at the time. And, you know, then I remember when that was a year later turned into actually take off your pants. And then the next show was take off all your fucking clothes. Um, and now you have, you know, uh, these shows that are going on right now where, yeah, okay, now you go through shows naked. It's just the thing, you know. You go through a show naked and you get the noise-canceling headphones and they stick you in front of Brad. It's a thing. Um, but I remember the first time that we were like, can we fucking do this? So what would I tell myself? Maybe do that sooner because it's okay. Uh, you can work with the insurance company. You can work with the police. You can make this event uh, actually safe and still tie them up and go for it. It's fine. Um, that said, that was our journey. Um, and you know, those first shows would not have been the same thing if that's what we had started doing and that there wasn't a ramp up to what everybody now knows of blackout. Um, 
you know, I don't know, I'd say be bold, be brave. But then I look back and I'm like, I think Blackout has been pretty bold over the last six or seven years. So in a way, I I actually, um, I really wouldn't change much creatively. Um, I really wouldn't. I think that we tried to make the best decisions we could. Um, And looking back, even if they weren't the right decisions, I understand why we made that choice in that time. And I think it was probably a lesson that we needed to learn. So, uh, you know, we've taken a lot of hits, I think, for the industry. Um, A lot of people are starting now at a level that took us many years to ramp up to. Uh, That pisses me off a little bit. But again, I'm also like, I, I, I can't say that I regret any of it and and consequently I don't know I just say do your fucking best man because somehow it got us here um and it's a a pretty it's a pretty nice place to be for blackout and uh we're you know honestly we're just really happy that happy we're uh fulfilled that you know people respond to it and that we're able to continue um delivering this experience for people because they want it and you know i don't want to sound like a total ass or too pretentious but artistically that's all you can really ask um you know we're at a place right now where you get just the the amount of emails you get on a daily basis um from people all over the world who want to ask questions and want to know more and want to be a part of it and then the people that are a part of it who want more who want this who want that and you know sometimes it's really overwhelming kind of hard to deal with but when push comes to shove uh not a lot of people who put art out into the world get that response um and so we feel pretty privileged and lucky to be able to experience that and um yeah i just i just hope we get to continue Josh, that was it for all my questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer all of them. Do you have any final thoughts? Um, I'll just get this out of the way quickly. You know, I think the my first final thought is that people need to experience it for themselves. Uh, and if they've never done it, whether it be 21 or the off-season show coming up, uh, it is a very polarizing piece. You're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. Um, but if you have an inkling that it's possibly something you might like you you got to get off the fucking computer and stop reading reviews and just buy a ticket and go through and see what happens um and uh i guarantee you're gonna either love it or hate it um and you know with that said we have uh two opportunities coming up uh for people to experience blackout all of which can be found on our website which is the blackout experience.com uh we have the uh virtual show online show called 21 uh, that is a series that has just recently started in December of 2015. Currently, chapters one and two are available. They're only $1.99 uh, per person, uh, but you have to adhere to a certain number of rules and regulations before you can actually sign up. So anyone within the continental United States can sign up for 21 uh, chapters one and two right now. And then anyone on the West Coast, we have the off-season show coming up in Los Angeles. Uh, That's going to be starting, I believe, on March 4th. It's going to run for three weeks. And again, tickets are available at theblackoutexperience.com. And uh, in terms of final thoughts, you know, obviously... Uh, we we stay pretty tight-lipped about Blackout. And um, even though I've just sat here for the last hour, probably telling you too much. Um, you know, what I'll say is, is that it's... Well, now I'm just repeating myself, but people need to experience it if they want it. And it's the kind of thing that uh, it's going to cause a reaction. And if you are you know, into live experiences. And for me, that means theater, that means rock concerts, that means, you know, a a myriad of different things. Um, That this is something you might be into and ultimately, you know, hopefully enjoy. And I guess my uh, uh, sort of bringing this to conclusion is that a lot of what I've seen with the movie, the documentary, the Blackout Experience, um, and the, the release of 21 and how Blackout is now really officially reaching a just significantly wider audience than we ever have in the past. Uh, it's hard to hear people 
uh, reading uh, about it and then posting these crazy ass opinions um, that may or may not be true. And so, you know, I just, I, I guess creatively, I'm like, it, it is real. It is a show. It's just a show. <laughs> um, and you should just buy a ticket and, um, and join us and see what happens. And uh, all of that can be done through our website, theblackoutexperience.com. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome.